Okay, now let's turn in our Bibles to uh, the uh, passage in the Word of God that refers to uh, the Lord's Supper. It's 1 Thessalonians, uh, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So let's everybody get our Bibles and uh, let's turn over there to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. And uh, let's re read it together. Well, actually, uh, we, we should start at verse 20 because that's where the passage begins in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, verse 20. So uh, let's everybody get, get our Bibles and uh, let's read together. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, it's verses 20 and we'll just read through the end of the chapter. Let's everybody get our Bibles and let's read it together. Together now, when ye come together, therefore into one place, Amen. You may be seated. And uh, as we think uh, again of the Lord's Supper uh, this evening, and um, as we study the Word of God, now again, the Lord's Supper was instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, actually, as the Bible says here, uh, the same night in verse 23, the same night in which he was betrayed, his last night upon earth is when he instituted uh, the Lord's Supper. Now, and uh, so... Uh, he instituted the Lord's Supper, and then he went to Gethsemane, and then he was arrested. And that was his last night upon earth before his uh, uh, crucifixion. So uh, that, that's where we get the Lord's Supper from. See, it was instituted by the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Now, here we find that it was observed in the local church and in the church at Corinth, and we find that they practiced uh, the Lord's uh, uh, Supper. Now, in verse um, 26, uh, 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 the Bible says here, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, see, you show the Lord's death till he come. Now, in other words, see, it is a uh, proclamation of the Lord's death, but it's until he come. Now, um, as we study the, the Word of God, as we mentioned this morning, say all these verbs are in the imperative and in the present tense, which means that we should observe the Lord's Supper and we should not only observe it, but we should continually observe the Lord's Supper. That's the teaching of the Word of God. Now, and the Lord's Supper is in effect until Jesus Christ comes back again at his second coming. Because in verse 26, it says, show the Lord's death, you see, till he 
come. That's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see, uh, this is uh, the proclamation of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, say, that's the central teaching of the Christian faith, is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he shed his blood so that you and I might be forgiven of our uh, sins. Now, again, the word there in verse 26 is uh, show. Now, now, once again, I think that's very, very unfortunate because it's actually the word that means to preach. See, the Lord's Supper is not a showing forth, whatever that might mean, uh, but it's a proclamation, a preaching of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we get into a little Bible doctrine here and uh, a little theology. See, nothing is said here about the resurrection. It's not a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, his resu uh, resurrection verified that he died for our sins, but that's not what the Lord's Supper is all about. See, uh, the Lord's Supper or communion has to do with, um, uh, with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we pointed out uh, this morning, see, the word show is actually the word that means to preach or to proclaim. And so what the Lord's Supper was, it was a proclamation that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that the only way of salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Like, for instance, we read in the book of Hebrews, see, uh, uh, several times in the book of Hebrews, it says that he once died uh, for our sins. He did it one time. He died on the cross so that we might have uh, salvation. Turn in your Bible to um, Acts chapter 13, and in Acts chapter 13 and verse 38, and there are uh, several times, several passages we could point out, but here in uh, Acts chapter 13 and in verse 39, uh, verse 38 actually, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren. Now, uh, Paul is preaching here. He's preaching in the city of Antioch on his uh, missionary uh, journey here. Now, in Acts 13, 38, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, of course, speaking of Jesus Christ, this man is preached. Now, that's the same word exactly as the word show. S-H-E-W, in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. See, it's the word proclaim, you see, and um, see, or uh, through this man, see, is preached, see, and at the Lord's Supper, it is a preaching about Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Now, uh, as it says here in Acts 13, 38, through this man is preached unto you, say, the forgiveness of sin. So, say, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that, that he shed his blood so that our sins might be uh, forgiven. So, it's not a um, showing type thing, say, to uh, show something or to even illustrate uh, something. But according to the Word of God, it's a time of the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. And see, that's something we always need to go back to. Now, if uh, our churches followed that, there would never be a liberal church. There would never be a modernistic church. See, uh, because they'd be preaching the cross of Jesus Christ every time they observe the Lord's Supper or the matter of uh, communion. So uh, that's what it's all about. See, uh, it's a proclamation, it's a preaching, and that word that's used several times in the book of Acts re is that word show, which means uh, preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
See, you're, you're preaching. You're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. See, the emphasis is on the fact that Jesus Christ died and shed his blood for us on the cross of uh, Calvary. Now, again, uh, all of these words in verse uh, 24, 23, um, 24, when it says, uh, this do ye, see, that's an imperative, present tense, we're to do it, keep on doing it. Um, in verse 25, the word do. In verse 24, the word eat. See, all of these words are in the imperative. That simply means they're a command of God, and, uh, and it's in the present tense. Uh, it's a command that we need to constantly be obeying. See, we are responsible under God to uh, observe the Lord's table, to always be reminded that he shed his blood to die for our sins on the cross of, uh, of Calvary. Now, again, keep in mind, it is a local church ordinance. It is never to be done outside the local church, uh, only in the local church as we read and study the Word of God. See, it's a local church uh, ordinance. It's to be practiced by uh, the local uh, uh, church. Now, there are a couple words here that we brought out this morning that it's good to re-emphasize this evening. See, and uh, one is that word, you see, unworthily in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, drink this cup of the Lord, say unworthily. Now, again, that's an adverb, and what it's talking about is the manner in which a person was partaking of the Lord's Supper. See, it, it, it's not saying that uh, someone has to be worthy to participate. That's, uh, that would be a different word altogether. But obviously, as we pointed out again this morning, in verses 20, 21, and 22, you have the uh, explanation of what it means to be unworthily and to uh, uh, observe in an unworthily way. And obviously what that's talking about uh, is that they made a big joke and a party uh, out of this love feast that they had, their fellowship supper. Now again, see, the love feast was never sanctioned in the Bible. It was never ordained in the Bible. And that's why we need to be very, very careful of things that are not sanctioned in the Bible and ordained in the Bible. Now, the reason for that is because they usually lead to a lot of misunderstanding and uh, a lot sometimes uh, just uh, trouble uh, they lead to. Now, see, what you have here, you had the rich people and the poor people in the church at Corinth. And uh, what, what was going on was that the rich people had all of their nice expensive food and they would bring it to this love feast, which was similar to a fellowship supper, and they would not want uh, the poor people to eat their good food. And so the poor people would be hungry. They didn't have any uh, food to eat. And these um, uh, richer people would not share their food. Now, that would be a uh, uh, a terrible thing and an embarrassing thing, and you can see how they they really uh, sinned against God, and and uh, they were so self-centered and selfish. They're just thinking uh, about themselves now, uh, and so that was the way and the attitude they had when they went in and they observed the Lord's Supper. See, and what Paul is saying: see, you participate in an unworthily way. See, again, just good to read it in verse 20 and following, 1 Corinthians 11. And when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's uh, supper. Now, see what he's saying. See, you were not really eating the Lord's supper. You were just coming together to have a big time, uh, to uh, a frivolous time, uh, whatever, and uh, a time of joking and all that type of a thing whatever, but you are not observing the Lord's table. See, you missed out on what the Lord's Supper is all about, because he says in verse 21, for in eating, everyone taketh before um, other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is uh, drunken. By the way, that word drunken is the word that means to be drunk. 
to be overcome with uh, strong drink. And so they made a, an absolute mockery of that love feast. Now, and see, that's the attitude they had in coming into the Lord's Supper. Now, he says in verse 22, What, have ye not houses to eat in and to drink in? Or despise, say, the church of God? See, what he's saying, you're making a mockery of the church of God. I was speaking to someone uh, not too long ago, and they mentioned that uh, they attended a Bible-believing church, but they said they got a new pastor uh, in the church. And they said that it was absolutely uh, uh, a very unsacred uh, way they observed the Lord's Supper. They, uh, they said it was like a time of joking around and uh, messing around, so to speak. And this person who was a member of that church all their life, and they got the, the new pastor, they said they, they could never go back to that church because uh, uh, this woman said to me, they make a mockery of the Lord's Supper. Uh, she indicated it was like a big time of joking around and, and, and fooling around, say, at, uh, when they observed the Lord's Supper. And she said she was totally offended, though a member of that church all her life, and uh, could never go back uh, uh, to that church. Now, uh, it was such a lighthearted, uh, frivolous way that she said they were partaking of the Lord's table. And she said it was an absolute mockery, similar to what we have here. What, uh, verse 22, what have ye not houses to eat and drink in and despise, see, the church of God? You made a mess of the church of God. And, uh, and shame... Uh, the, uh, them that have not. In other words, say, you would not share your food with somebody else. Now, in the past, before COVID, we had a lot of fellowship suppers here at the church. And uh, usually, if somebody would make something and uh, they uh, liked it and it was their like special dish, they'd go around and ask everybody, uh, did you get some of my food? You know, it wasn't that someone said, man, I have this good food, but I don't want you to eat it. You better not touch my food. This is just for certain people. Usually at the fellowship supper, it's the opposite would take place. You know, make sure you get some of that. That's really good. I made that uh, 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 special. But you see here, the Bible says they were shaming uh, the, uh, the poor people. They were embarrassing them. The whole thing was a big embarrassment. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? And, and Paul says, see, obviously I praise you not. Now, see, the next verse, for I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered. And he goes into the Lord's Supper. See, that is how you interpret the word unworthily. See, people who would not share their food with others at the love feast and people who made an absolute mockery of the uh, not only the love feast, but you can imagine their attitude when they came in to observe the Lord's Supper. They had no spiritual attitude at all. And this is what I think this woman was getting at. There was nothing spiritual about it at all when she was telling me about how they observed it in church. She said it was, uh, uh, it was nothing spiritual, just a, a, a big joke, and they, they missed the whole meaning and the sacredness of uh, the Lord's table. But now, uh, you see, uh, he goes into the Lord's Supper. And that is the best interpretation of what it means to participate unworthily. See, they came, their hearts were not right with God. They weren't even right with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, uh, they wouldn't even share uh, their food. It was an absolute mockery. You see, and that's what he's talking about. He's saying now, when you come with that attitude, see, to observe the Lord's Supper, you are participating uh, unworthily. In other words, see, the manner in which you are partaking, there's nothing sacred about it with you. Um, it, it's just, uh, uh, again, a joke, uh, something that you're just going through and you, you missed out on any... Uh, biblical meaning of uh, the Lord's, uh, uh, the Lord's uh, table. So it's always good to remember that's what it's talking about there. Again, as I mentioned this morning, there's a, a man in the church and 
every time the Lord's Supper was distributed, uh, he would say, unworthy, unworthy. I am not worthy to participate in the Lord's uh, Supper. And then someone talked to the man and uh, helped him understand, see, no one is worthy. The only worthiness we have is through the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not, it's talking about the way you participate. See, the spirit and attitude in relation to the way you participate. And uh, the man was told, we're all sinners saved by grace. See? And uh, uh, we're all uh, unworthy, but you need to partake, you see, uh, even as an unworthy person, if you just realize you're a sinner in need of God's help uh, in your life. So a lot of people get all mixed up with that word show and then the word unworthily. And then uh, in verse 29, we have that word damnation. Now, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, see these people that were coming in and they had no spiritual thought at all. They were just going through a religious ceremony. And um, then the Bible uh, uh, says here, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, the thing here about damnation, again, we want to emphasize that very, very uh, uh, clearly. Again, that is an unfortunate translation of the word. Now, uh, in Mark 16, 16, it says that he that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, that word damned is a word that refers to those that are unsaved. Now, he's not talking here about the unsaved. Now, that word damnation, now again, it's an unfortunate translation here in the Bible. Uh, and if you have a footnote in your Bible, most Bibles will tell you that it, it's the word that means to judge. See, and that de uh, condemnation is referring, see, to God's disciplinary action in our lives. God disciplining us as a child of God. Now, how do we know that? Because the Bible is very, very clear. See, uh, and explains that in verses 30 and following. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, see, that was a chastening hand of God upon them. See, upon God's uh, children. And then he says in verse 31, see, if we would, see, you talk what, see what he's talking about, see, if we would judge ourselves, then God would not have to judge us. But if we would judge ourselves, we should not uh, uh, be judged. Um, so, but when we are judged, see, by God in a disciplinary way, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32, see, what does he say? We are chastened. That's God's discipline in your life and in my life. Say, God will discipline us. Now, so um, when he says there, uh, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, what he's talking about there is God's judgment upon the life of a child of God. Say, God's disciplinary judgment. And that is certainly taught in the Word of God. See, and by the way, um, that is a great indication of whether somebody is saved or not. Now, uh, see, if somebody is saved and they get out of the will of God, God will chasten them. In other words, He'll judge them in that sense. No question about that as we study the Word of God, and everybody would say, certainly, that's a teaching of the Word of God. Now, uh, that means that if you are saved, you get out of the will of God, see, God will chastise you. Now, He brings circumstances, circumstances into your life to wake you up spiritually so that you repent of your sin and get right with the Lord. Now, the chastening here was that some were weak and sickly among you, and then the Bible says, see, some actually sleep. The word sleep is used a believer's death. Now, not unbelievers, never refers to an unbeliever. It refers to the body 
of a believer. See, the body of a believer goes to the grave. Now, the spirit goes to be with the Lord. Say, by the way, say, you and I are not a body. Say, you and I are not bodies. Now, in this sense, you live in your body. See, you live in a body, but uh, you are not a body. Why? See, someday the body in which you and I live is going to die. And what do they do with that body now? They put it in the grave. Now, and the Bible refers to that in the Bible uh, uh, as sleep for the child of God. See, their body is asleep in the grave. But now, say their spirit, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Say their spirit goes to be with the Lord in heaven. That's very clear uh, in the Word of God. So always remember, say you and I live in a body. And someday the body is going to die and go to the grave. And it'll sleep there until the resurrection day. But the real you, the real person of who we are, goes to be with the Lord. And uh, that's why I use the word sleep there. And that is only used of uh, God's children and uh, not of their spirit, but of their body. So we see here how God chastened them. That's what that judgment, that word damnation is simply referring to God's disciplinary judgment in the life of a child of God. It's not saying, now again, um, sometimes you read the Bible and uh, it creates some questions in your mind. Now, see, it doesn't mean that if you do not observe the Lord's Supper in the right way, you'll be damned to hell. See, it's not talking about that. See, it's not talking about damnation uh, in that way at all. Again, that's a very unfortunate translation of that word. It's a word that simply means judge. And if we would judge ourselves, see, God would not judge us. That's what the word is talking about. See, the disciplinary hand of God's judgment in our lives as uh, God's children. Now, um, probably that word damnation is put in there because, again, see, to understand our English Bible, we need to understand where it comes from. See, uh, basically, the King James Bible is an Anglican Bible, Church of England Bible, 1611. Now, see, uh, again, how did the Church of England begin? Uh, the origin was the king, king of England, what was it, Henry VIII, I believe, uh, wanted to get a divorce. The Pope wouldn't let him. So he said, well, we're going to break away and start our own church in England. And that's the beginning of the Episcopal Church. See, the Church of England. Now, these men that translated our Bible in 1611 were Anglican people. Now, number one, see, they did not believe in the local church. See, and, uh, um, and they believed that, see, the Lord's Supper, uh, very similar to the Roman Catholic Church, that it was a sacrament. Now, what do we mean that the Lord's Supper uh, or communion to them is a sacrament, and that means that it has saving power associated with it. Now, in other words, you do not have salvation unless you uh, um, uh, observe what they would refer to as the sacrament of uh, communion or the Eucharist or whatever they would uh, refer to it uh, as. Now, see... And that's how they believe that was a means of salvation. See, they believe that if you did not, just like an Episcopal church today, um, and many times they don't refer to their uh, pastor as pastor, they refer to their pastor as a priest, and they are very similar to the Roman Catholic Church in a lot of ways. Now, and actually they just broke away and have a lot of the same doctrine. Now, see, and uh, their teaching is that the Lord's Supper is a sacrament. See, it has some saving power associated with it. In other words, it saves your soul. Now, for instance, like in the Roman Catholic Church, and similar to the Anglican Church, see, they believe that uh, the bread at the Lord's Supper, that wafer in the Eucharist or the Mass, that a Roman Catholic eats or uh, uh, takes into their body is actually the body of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not symbolic of his body. 
But when you eat it, you are eating the body of Jesus Christ. Now, when uh, a Roman Catholic, and usually they just uh, uh, allow the priest to do it, but he drinks of that cup, see, and um, at the Mass, uh, the Eucharist, say that uh, fruit of the vine, which the Bible refers to it as the fruit of the vine, say uh, they use wine, and uh, uh, that that wine actually becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. And you are drinking his literal blood. Now, not, not symbolic at all. Say every Roman Catholic and a lot of the Episcopalians, when they observe it as a sacrament, say that's how you receive Christ. See, and that's one of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. You receive him by eating him physically. Physically, you eat his body, and that uh, drink at the Lord's uh, at the communion actually becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's how you partake of his blood, by drinking his blood, and uh, so forth. Now, say all of that is totally unscriptural. That is unbiblical. See, the Lord's Supper is not a sacrament, and it has no saving power at all. It is only for saved people who know the Lord as their Savior. And uh, by the way, see, uh, the teaching about the Lord's Supper is very important. If someone does not understand the teaching about the Lord's Supper, they'll not understand the Bible. They will not have a handle on the Bible. You see, uh, and that's why a lot of people do not understand the Lord's Supper, and uh, a lot of churches don't even hardly observe uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, it's a total misunderstanding. And, but now you see, in a lot of churches, they teach that it is a sacrament. It's a means of grace. How do you receive Jesus Christ? By drinking his blood. Not the wine that's in that cup that the priest has. That becomes miraculously the blood of Christ. And that wafer that they eat actually becomes his literal flesh. And as a result of that, it has saving power. It's a sacrament and it'll help you get to heaven. Now, see, the Bible, of course, doesn't teach anything like that. It doesn't teach anything along that line. That is not scriptural. That is not biblical. See, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When he instituted it, and in future studies, you may go into that, in the Gospels, see, he was observing the Passover. Now, the Passover was a memorial. It reminded the nation of Israel that they were redeemed out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Now, uh, most Jewish synagogues do not observe the Passover. You say, oh yes, uh, Pastor, uh, the kids have off from school and they observe, observe the Passover. No, they really don't observe it in a biblical way. And here's the reason why they don't. They don't say anything about the blood. Say, nothing is said about the blood in the average Jewish uh, uh, synagogue. See, they stay away from the blood. See, they don't say anything about that. They say, uh, our people were liberated. And we need to liberate people. But the whole purpose of the Lord's or uh, the Passover was to remind Israel that they were delivered as uh, a result of the blood being applied to their doorposts. And that's how uh, they were delivered. The, uh, the firstborn uh, uh, of every home that didn't have the blood applied of course, uh, was uh, sentenced to death and under the death uh, angel. Now, see, uh, Jesus observed the Passover, see, and uh, now he observed that Passover with his disciples. Now, you see, and he took the bread and he lifted it up and he said, this is my body. And then he took the cup and he lifted it up and said, this is uh, my blood. See, obviously not pointing to his literal body, not telling them that they had to drink and eat his body, but just like 
The Passover was symbolic now, you see, of God's deliverance by blood from Egypt. So, see, the Passover uh, or the Lord's Supper is to be done in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, to remember that he died for us because he went on and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Matthew 26, 28, say, this is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. He was saying that I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die for your sins so that your sins might be forgiven. And you're always to observe the Lord's Supper as a memorial to what I did on the cross of Calvary. I died for your sin. Turn back there to Matthew chapter 26. Now, in Matthew chapter 26, here is one of the incidences in the gospel where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And it's Matthew chapter 26. Now, in Matthew chapter 26, and we read there, in, uh, uh, in verse uh, 28. Now, and um, he said there, and he took the cup and gave thanks, verse 27, and gave to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood, say, of the New Testament. Say, God's new covenant with man, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Say, it's a symbol of his blood that was shed so that sins could be uh, forgiven. So that's a clear teaching of the Word of God. There's no question uh, uh, about that. Now, uh, but see, it is not, the Lord's Supper is not a sacrament. It has nothing to do with salvation. See, it has to do uh, with remembering that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Why? That's the most important truth in all the world. See, that's what all Christianity is based on. That anybody, no matter who they are, can be forgiven of their sin because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of uh, uh, Calvary. And But see, a lot of people are mistaken and misinformed about the Lord's Supper. I mentioned this morning, even in the defined Bible, on this verse in the Bible, it says uh, on page, uh, what's it, uh, 100 and, uh, uh, 515, it says, you see, that that word damnation means consignment to hell. See, that's a false interpretation of the Lord's Supper. Nobody's consigned to hell because uh, they uh, uh, participate the wrong way in the Lord's Supper. See, the word damnation, again, is that word that simply means, you see, judgment. God's disciplinary judgment, and that's clearly brought out here in uh, the Word of God. And then, uh, um, see, the Bible says there in verse 28, but let a man examine himself. Now, again, see what Paul is saying, you did not examine yourself. Many of the church at Corinth did not examine themselves before they participated in the Lord's table. See, but he says, examine himself. Now, again, it's individual and it's personal. It's not corporate. Uh, nobody can examine somebody else. See, it's individual, myself, it's personal. So examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, see, what he's saying there is, I want you to examine yourself so you can participate in the right way. So you will participate in the Lord's Supper. Say, I don't want you to turn away uh, from the ordinance of the Lord's table, but I want you to examine yourselves before you partake. And that's the thing, obviously, that they were uh, uh, not doing. And that's why he goes on and he talks about how God uh, judged them. And uh, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, many sleep. Why? Because they didn't judge themselves and they, part uh, they were partaking in a very uh, carnival type atmosphere. See, there is no spiritual impact upon their lives 
when they observe the Lord's table with the attitude they had in coming to the Lord's table, which their attitude they had at that, uh, uh, at that uh, love feast. So then God judged them. And the Bible says, many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, again, see, that's how God judged them. They're weak, uh, sick, and the Bible uh, says here, some sleep or some actually uh, uh, died. So that was the chastening hand of God. Now, as we mentioned, see, that I believe is a way that someone can discern whether someone is truly saved or not. Now, someone who says they're saved, but they are living in sin. And that goes on and on it goes. Now, they say they are saved. Now, and then, but uh, as time goes on, they are never chastised by God. You see, uh, uh, there are things that are not brought into their lives to give them a wake-up call. And I believe that's the way you in, uh, can discern whether someone is unsaved. Because if they are saved, God will deal with them. And uh, deal with them in a very definite way. And uh, that, that's just the way God does. And we all know that. In other words, we read about it in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Amen? That's, and he's talking there uh, not about just fathers uh, chastising their children. He's talking there about the family of God. Say that uh, he, he chastises us. He gives us a spanking uh, to produce holiness in our lives. Might be good to turn over there to Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Now, um, in Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll not go into a lot of detail, but uh, he mentions here that every father disciplines his children. If a father does not discipline his children, the Bible says he does not love his children. Someone says, I love my children too much to discipline them. No, that's saying you do not love your children according to God's word. Now, uh, he says here, uh, well, we could start at verse 9. Um, for, uh, furthermore, we have had our fathers of our flesh corrected us and gave them a reverence. We thank God for them. That was for our benefit whenever they disciplined us. Uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us, chastised us, uh, uh, after their own pleasure. But he, see, God chastises us for our profit. See, so that we will grow. We will be brought back to the Lord that we might be partakers, see, the Bible says, of his holiness. That's one way that God helps us to live a holy life and to be holy people, according to the Bible. It's through uh, uh, chastisement. And then in verse 11, it says, Now no chastening of the present, Hebrews 12, verse 11, seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, say, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So that's talking about God's disciplinary judgment in our lives. And the Bible is very, very clear that God, uh, in a disciplinary, chastening way, chastises all of us as God's children to help us to be righteous and holy. Now, the Bible there in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 indicates that if a person is not chastised by God, he is not a child of God. And that's a good way to prove. You take somebody that says they're saved, they live years and years outside the will of God, and uh, they give no evidence of salvation in any way. I believe that that person is not saved. Because if they were saved, God would deal with them. And you have known people, I have known people uh, like that, where they really, um, certainly, uh, they said they were saved, but then they gave no indication by their life that they were saved. And it goes on years and years and years. Sometimes I check things out uh, about, about people like that, and um, they say, well, they, uh, 
They never turned to the Lord. They, they, never, uh, they never repented. They never felt sorry. I'm talking about people that have done some big sins, so to speak, uh, serious things. And I believe that's the indication that they were never, ever saved to begin with. Because if you are saved, God will give you a spanking when you get out of the will of God. See, and here the Bible says some were weak, sickly among you, and uh, uh, many sleep. In other words, say, God brings circumstances into our lives to help us to repent. Now, if we will not repent, He'll take us home early and we forfeit uh, our opportunity to serve God down here. And um, so that's the clear teaching of the Word of God. You say, Pastor, have you ever uh, known people like that? And I believe there are a few circumstances where I absolutely have. No question about it, where uh, uh, people live for God, they even serve God, and then they get out of the will of God, and uh, a year later they died. I believe that's a very clear indication that you see that that person was saved out of the will of God and God uh, chast uh, chastised them, just like we read here in the Bible. So, um, see, that's what happens when people do not respond to God's chastening in their lives. See, that's why uh, the positive thing is the next verse. See, what's the next verse say? For if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. We wouldn't be disciplined by God. We wouldn't have to have God to step into our lives to uh, uh, give us a wake-up call. I think of uh, 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 actually a uh, very wonderful preacher of the Word of God, an outstanding, I would say, uh, preacher of the Word of God. And uh, he mentioned how God dealt with him and uh, how uh, he was brought up in a Christian home. His two brothers were uh, preachers. And uh, on, uh, on Sunday morning, he'd come to church, and then he would go out in his car and he'd hot rod around. And... Uh, and uh, so forth. And so everybody thought he was in church, but he wasn't in church. He'd just come, show his face, and then he'd go immediately and he'd hot rod around. Well, um, he gives a testimony how he was hot rodding around Sunday morning during the Sunday morning service, and he got into a serious accident and he almost lost his life. And he said, that was a wake-up call for me. He said, that was God chastening me because I was the biggest hypocrite in the world. Now, I was saved, but I was running from God and so forth. And uh, as a result of that accident, uh, he said that he almost lost his life. And, but that's the thing that turned him around to dedicating his life to the Lord and really living for the Lord. He said, God really chastised me. In fact, he, he messed up his arm so much that if, uh, if you ever see a preacher with a crooked arm, I mean... It's going like two different directions. That's the fellow I'm talking about because that was a result of it. See, he, he really uh, almost lost his arm and so forth. But you see, that was a chast chastening hand of God. Now, you see, in verse 31, see, if we would judge ourselves, then we're not judged by God. See, just like these people that he's talking about in the context here. See, if they would have judged themselves, um, Paul wouldn't have said what he had to say about them. But they did not judge themselves and as a result, they were under the chastening hand uh, of, uh, uh, of God. So, see, a lot of wonderful things are brought out in relation to the Lord's Supper. Now, again, the thing we want to make very, very clear as we study about the Lord's Supper is that it's not negative. Paul is not saying, I don't want you to observe the Lord's Supper in the church. No, what he's saying, I want you to, you need to, it's a proclamation of the death of Jesus Christ, but what he's saying, I want you to do it in the right way. I want you to do it the way you should do it, you see. And so he's not discouraging them from participating in the Lord's Supper. He's encouraging them to do it, but do it the way God says you should do it. Don't make a, a, a joke out of uh, the Lord's Supper. See, that's why he says in verse 28, but let a man examine himself. 
But you see, then you have the positive. And so let them eat. See, it's not that someone says, I'm a great sinner. I know I've sinned against God. No, examine yourself, confess your sin, get your heart right with God, and then you participate. You say, uh, get it under the blood, uh, whether it's a bad conscience or uh, uh, something you know you need to be forgiven of. Get it under the blood. Confess it. Realize Jesus died for that sin and to forgive you of that sin. And uh, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, 1 John 1, 9 is not talking about the unsaved. It's not a salvation verse. He's talking about fellowship, 1 John chapter 1. And uh, as God's children, if we confess our sins, God is ready to forgive us of our sin. But, see, in a parental sense, not in a judicial sense. We've already been forgiven of our sins, but we're not perfect. No Christian is a perfect person. Nobody is perfect after they get saved. That's why you and I need to confess our sins. See, and the Bible says, John includes himself, for if we would confess our sins, he's faithful to his word to uh, cleanse us, clean us up, and forgive us of all of our sins. See, as a father would forgive his children. He's always ready to forgive us, cleanse us, clean us up. And, uh, but our responsibility is to examine ourselves and to confess our sins. See, uh, that's the responsibility we have. Otherwise, uh, you see, uh, God will have to step in and chastise us. 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, another great uh, verse, but it's not a salvation verse. It's talking to God's children about fellowship. See, the blood and the Lord's Supper reminds us of this. It keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Even after we're saved, we need to confess our sins to God. We need to examine ourselves. But here's the thing. Uh, the... Uh, the, the Bible teaches, see, that that forgiveness in the life of a child of God, a saved, born-again child of God, is still based on the blood of Jesus Christ. See, the only cleansing agent in the Bible is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, as we apply it to the auto mechanic, our cars are always in need of repair, amen? Amen. Uh, we wish they weren't, but uh, uh, you talk to any mechanic and <laughs> they'll tell you cars are always in need of repair in one way or uh, uh, another. You see, that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. See, we need to get repaired as God's children. And periodically, we need to observe the Lord's Supper. You see, that's what it's all about. So we might be repaired so we might draw closer to the Lord. And that's why everybody that really studies the Lord's Supper, and by the way, very few do. There's not a, good, a lot of good Bible teaching about the Lord's Supper. But uh, those who study it uh, in the Word of God say it's a great means to holiness. It helps us to be more holy in our life. It has nothing to do with salvation but it has everything to do with sanctification, to make us holy, to make us godly. See, this is one of the ways, one of the most important ways that God has ordained in your life and in my life to be a holy person is to biblically observe the Lord's table because that's the time we examine ourselves, that's the time we judge ourselves. Again, I bring out that's emphatic. That means you judge and examine only yourself. You do not have the responsibility to judge um, and examine anybody else. It's a personal thing. That's the Lord's Supper. But if we rightly observe it, according to the Word of God, it's one of the great ways that God has ordained to help us to be holy godly people. See, 
because we are always in need of repair. Amen? Uh, we, we should say, oh, you know, uh, uh, some people teach you, you get saved and man, you're just a great Christian from the day you get saved until the day you die. Well, it doesn't always work that way. Amen. See, there are ups and downs. There's a lot of growth and development. Uh, we need to constantly be growing. Our standard in the word of God is perfection to be Christ like that's why Paul said, I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. Uh, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We need to uh, be more conformed to Christ the older we get in the things of, uh, uh, of God, you see, and uh, that, that's uh, uh, what is needed in our lives. And you see, God has ordained the Lord's Supper to help us to be more Christ-like to be more holy, to be more godly. Now, that's why, see, the Lord's Supper should never be ritualistic. It can be very, very ritualistic. Okay, we observe the Lord's Supper a certain time, every time, and uh, we have a sermon, and then we hurry up and observe the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. Or uh, it's just a, a ritualistic thing. Let's hurry up, get it done, move on. Uh, and the attitude is that it, there's not much meaning, it's not very important, so just move on uh, and, and so forth. So many times it is done in a very ritualistic way, and it is not done in a very spiritual way. But you see, um, it should always be done, obviously, in a spiritual way. We examine ourselves, and then we judge ourselves. By the way, that's a great... Uh, encouragement in the Word of God. Amen? Do you want to be judged of God? Do I want to be judged of God? Absolutely not. Amen? I don't want God to have to judge me. But see what the Bible says. If we would judge ourselves, He would not judge us. So that's a great reason to confess your sin, get your heart right with God. Amen? Because if you don't, God will judge you. You see, and you don't want God to judge you because... Uh, that can be rather uh, severe in our uh, lives. So, the Lord's Supper. Uh, it's great to emphasize the Lord's Supper. And by the way, we have just been touching the hem of the garment. There is so much other rich, wonderful Bible teaching about the Lord's Supper in the Word of God. For instance, a great study is just study in the Gospels when Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, to study about the Lord's Supper in the book of Acts, and it's great teaching and blessing. So we're just uh, scratching uh, the surp surface, and what we're trying to do is help us to understand that there is a lot of misunderstanding about the uh, Lord's Supper. There's a lot of unscriptural, unbiblical teaching about uh, the Lord's Supper. Now, always keep in mind the Lord's Supper is never for an unsaved person. Only saved people should participate in the Lord's Supper. It has nothing to do with an unsaved person. Someone says, well, I want to uh, take communion to help me get to heaven or have my sins forgiven. No, see, it's only for saved people. No unsaved person should ever participate in uh, the Lord's Supper or communion. Now, again, you get into Bible teaching here. That's why parents should teach their children that unless they are saved, they should not participate in the Lord's Supper. Why? It's only for saved people, and that will help them to understand they need to be saved. Now, number two, see, the Lord's Supper is not for an uh, unbaptized person. Only baptized believers are to participate in in the Lord's Supper. Another great teaching uh, tool in the Bible that we need to teach our children, that children should not participate in the Lord's Supper until they are scripturally and biblically baptized, say, according uh, to the Word of God. See, nobody ever participated in the Lord's Supper in the Bible who was not saved and baptized. Say, no one. It's not open for everybody. It's open for the Bible study. It's open for the television audience or uh, the conference. No, 
it's a local church ordinance for those that are saved, those that are baptized. And then uh, it's not for unchurched people. Someone says, well, I'll observe the Lord's Supper on my own or at a school or a Bible conference or something like that. Say, now here's where you get into Bible teaching. Say, anybody that ever does that does not know what the Bible teaches about the Lord's Supper. See, that's unscriptural. That's unbiblical. See, it is a church ordinance. Now, what we mean by that, it is to be only practiced by the church. See, no one ever participated in the Lord's Supper in the Bible who is not saved and baptized and in fellowship with the local New Testament church. See, now, now people, uh, they have the attitude, anybody can participate in the Lord's Supper. Let's have a rally and let's have the Lord's Supper. See, that's all unbiblical. See, it's a local church uh, ordinance. And then, of course, the Lord's Supper is not for an unclean person. What we simply mean by that, someone who has known sin in their life and has not confessed that sin. See, uh, because if they do participate, the Bible says God will judge them. So it's a time when we examine ourselves, we judge ourselves, and um, it's a time we get our hearts right with God, we confess our sins, and then we move on spiritually. And uh, we seek to be a better Christian. Uh, we seek to be a more holy Christian. We seek to be a more godly uh, Christian. See, that's the beauty of the Lord's table, amen? And that's why God instituted it, and those who seriously study it. Now, most people don't seriously study the Lord's Supper. But you see, when you seriously study it, it's a means of sanctification to help us to be the sanctified people we ought to be. And that's why God, one of the great reasons why He has instituted uh, the Lord's Supper.